time I'll have Magic Mike Burke come forward oh <laughs> with Heavy Canoes to go over uh, our budget update. And I would ask the board, um, you know, there's a lot of information coming down, obviously, about the CARES Act. A lot for you to learn, a lot for us to learn um, as we begin this journey of um, working through our summer and ultimately our COVID response. So, Thank you. Um, Heather and Mike have done a, have a lot of work ahead of them, and they've been doing a lot, a lot of work up to this point, so I turn it over to Mr. Burke at this time. All right, thank you. Good evening. Yeah, it's exciting times on the budget front. Uh, we've got just our quick agenda here. Uh, Ms. Canoost is going to take us through some legislative proposals that have a budget impact. So it's not a full-fledged legislative update, but just really those financial items. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the current state budget proposals from the House and Senate, which are still in flux. And then I'm going to conclude the workshop talking about or a conversation about the federal stimulus funds headed our way. So with that, Ms. Canoose, why don't we jump right in? All right, so looking at the legislative timeline, we're over halfway through the legislative session. And just yesterday, there was a, a general revenue conference, and it had a lot of good news that Florida's economy, uh, the outlook is, is great, and it's rebounding, you know, as continues to rebound as it has in the, for the, the past months. Uh, the House and the Senate, uh, which is going to impact the House and Senate budget proposals uh, that were released just a couple weeks ago, um, because that was based on the old information. And if you recall, back in August of 2020, uh, the state, through the EDR, went back and they adjusted the general revenue estimates. They reduced them significantly downward based on the potential impact of the pandemic. And the, the subsequent uh, 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 general revenue um, conferences that have come out, the actual revenue collected has been significantly more than those projections. And so with this most recent projection released yesterday, they were able to add back an additional $2 billion into general revenue uh, for the fiscal years uh, 21 as well as 22. And so we know that that's going to, to significantly impact those budgets that were, were released just two weeks ago. In addition to the revenue estimating conference, there was also an en enrollment um, estimating conference um, last week. The final documents have not been um, uh, uploaded, uh, but we do know that the initial loss in, in student enrollment was projected at 48,000 students, and that has now been reduced downward to only 22,000 students. So with those two changes, they're very significant. It is going to have a, a, a significant impact on those budget proposals that we're going to go over today, but we know that they're going to change um, with our next um, meeting. And we have to uh, pay close attention for the next couple of weeks because the legislature just found out, right, they've got $2 billion more to work with, but they have not decided, they haven't broken that money into what they call the allocation process where they decide how much will go to education, how much will go to health and human services, that type of thing. And there is this perception we've heard from Mr. LaFace that schools are awash in federal funding and that we're, we may not, you know, so we, we've, it's important a couple of weeks here. Well, when we're coming down to the critical end, but uh, anyway, I just want to be clear, just because the state's doing better doesn't mean necessarily that that money will make its way into the FEFP. And looking at those bills that are that have significant um, budget implications, there are two that we are most concerned about, um, and those are those related to school choice and vouchers. Uh, so we have the House proposal and we have um, a Senate proposal. Uh, both of those bills consolidate the different scholarship programs, and they take those scholarship programs that used to be funded outside of FP, uh, FEFP and now put them and make them funded uh, through the FEFP program. Uh, with the House proposal, they're not increasing um, the current cap that we have on the vouchers, um, but they are expanding the number, the, which student populations would, or which scholarships would be exempt from that cap. So that, in essence, is then going to expand the number um, over and above what the current cap is. And looking at the Senate proposal, the Senate proposal does significantly increase uh, the cap of the number of students that would be eligible. It's very hard to estimate what the financial impact would be. Uh, so the, the state economist did project, did a projection on the Senate proposal that it could potentially cost up to $6.6 .6 billion in the fifth year of implementation. And to put that into perspective, our current proportion of uh, FES and McKay scholarships compared to the total statewide is about 5%. So if we take 5% of that $6.6 .6 billion, that would be over $300 million. And so the voucher program is turning into another 
charter school. And it is a much easier way um, because there are much less restrictions for private schools than they are for charter schools. So this really could um, expand exponentially and so could have a, a very a significant impact um, to school districts. Yeah, I'd just like to weigh in on this one too because th this could alter <laughs> uh, education as we know it in our state. The, to give you like a comparison, you know, charter schools started in 1996. So we've had 25 years of charter school growth. Over that time, they've grown to 341,000 students, which is about 12% of the state. That's their total budget is about 2.8 billion. So this, these vouchers potentially or scholarships could grow to 6.6 .6 billion in less than five years, more than double the charter schools in less than five years. Um, and Florida's leading the way in, the, in this, this voucher scholarship. And so it's a potential huge shift of money that normally would go into traditional public school, district operated schools to private schools that do not face the same level of accountability. And yeah, I think you're gonna see even charter school operators taking a step back and saying, boy, would it make more sense just to do a private school and take the voucher? Uh, so if this goes unchecked, we, we're gonna have more competition than ever. And uh, we could see a significant impact to our enrollment. Uh, you know, like nothing we've never seen before. So. We just can't state that much. That's why Ms. Canoose and I are both just <laughs> kind of harping on it here, but th this is a big deal. All right, next we have impact fees. And impact fees was a, a big topic a, a couple years ago. Uh, so with this bill, um, they're proposing to limit the amount that we could increase the fee, um, make us, you know, based on the increases, um, have to phase those increases in. Um, and what the county does right now, they per, uh, perform a survey every two years to look at the values to see how much they can charge. Um, this bill restricts that to they would have to only, they could only do it every four years. So it would limit the amount of time um, in between the increases as well. And then I wanted to highlight the taxes and fees for remote sales. This is related to making sure that we are, are collecting all the sales tax revenues that we should for internet sales. And the reason, and then any additional revenue that's collected would go to cover um, any um, shortfalls and enhance the unemployment fund. And uh, the reason why I you know, thought it was important to mention this is that you know, there's, whenever you're gonna have a shortfall, the money has to come from, some, from somewhere and potentially that's general revenue, state general revenue. That's where the majority of our funding comes from. Um, so we wanna make sure that, um, that any additional revenue streams that could be utilized to cover a shortfall are, because um, we are competing for the, the same uh, limited state revenue sources. Uh, we do have a bill on school district funding, which is expanding um, bonuses for um, Cambridge programs, um, and as well as certain um, preparatory classes that are necessary for ACE programs. The language is very vague as to whether we'd actually be getting additional revenue um, to cover the additional bonuses we'd have to pay out. And then the next bill is related to the civil liability damages for COVID-19. This one was actually signed into law to help to limit our school district uh, liability for those claims uh, filed related to COVID. And then the last two are related to charter schools. Uh, one is allowing uh, universities and colleges um, to authorize charter schools. The, uh, college and university would also be the LEA, so they would, the funding would not flow through us at all. The concern with this is once you have opened it up to another authorizer, they, they could continue to open it up to other entities other than um, colleges and universities. So not giving us really any control over the charter schools that are opening in our district. And then the last um, charter school uh, related bill is that they could just apply anytime and tell us when they're gonna open at any time just again limiting um, our control um, over the charter schools. So now getting into a, a breakdown, a comparison of the proposals, which are going to, to change um, significantly um, from what we have here, because initially they were built on a reduction in enrollment of 48,000. So based on the changes from last week, the next runs that we see, are, that's gonna be reduced down to 22,000. Uh, both the House and the Senate versions did have a reserve set aside for those missing students in case they were to come back. Um, so it's gonna be interesting to see how they treat that uh, with the new proposals that, that, um, that come out. The Senate proposal is showing just a zero flat, no change in um, funding. So it would be what we have right now. The House is showing a $50 increase. 
So you, you would think that, you know, no change in funding, that's great. You know, we're going to be status quo. But it really isn't because we, we are going to have a decline in enrollment uh, because we were held harmless this year. So we did, we are going to see an increase in students, but since we were held harmless at the 8,000 students that, that were lost, even though we're going to only have, um, we're, we are going to gain back a couple thousand students, we never saw the loss of the 8,000. So we're going to now have to recognize the loss of the 6,000 students, which equates to about $50 million. Uh, in addition to that, there is um, the, the House and the Senate, they've already uh, have agreed on uh, increases in the FRS rate and the impact um, in Palm Beach County, it's half of what it was last year. Last year, if you recall, it was about $15.5 million. This year, the impact's gonna be um, $8 million, and that equates to about $50 per student as well. Um, so just with those two factors, you know, even with the House proposal, you know, you know, that's enough to cover the increase in the FRS. If we were to stay flat, you know, we wouldn't even cover um, the increase in the FRS. And looking at, you know, just highlighting some other items from the proposals, um, the Senate version um, does not fully fund uh, the charter school capital outlay. They're the only ones to, um, the other proposals do. All proposals, um, surprisingly, are recommending to not roll back the RLE, which is the first time in several years um, that um, they're not rolling back the RLE. Granted, property values are not expected to, to increase that much, about two, two and a half percent. Um, but that is, it's at least something that they're, they're not going to roll back the RLE. Um, both the governor and the House um, are looking at, um, you know, restricting the, the ESSER funds that we're going to be getting. Um, specifically, the House is almost kind of turning it into like a categorical type funding um, to try to make sure that we're spending it in ways that they think is most beneficial. And so even for, you know, whatever the remaining portion would be, since they, they didn't restrict all of it, they still wanted us to be able to, to make us submit a spending plan to say exactly how we would be um, spending those funds. So it will be interesting to see how restrictive um, they'll be because the, the, within the federal guidance, they did really push to give districts as, mo as much flexibility as possible. Um, so it will be a question as to, you know, Florida's not the only state that is trying to, to really try to c control and direct how those funds are being utilized. So I did cover a lot of the challenges already. You know, we are facing a decline in enrollment, so that's a significant loss um, in revenue. Yeah, we did adjust staffing, but we know that adjusting staffing to enrollment is not going to get us the, the full amount of that lost revenue. It gets us about halfway there. Um, we also have the increase in FRS, which is significant as well. And just overall, um, and we don't know what, you know, what's gonna, if the bill passes for the vouchers, which we do expect that something is going to pass, you know, what that actual impact is going to be. And um, FPL is proposing an, a rate increase. And at a minimum, it's gonna be $3 million in FY22. Um, and it's phased in over multiple years. So we're looking at another $3 million in 23 and a million and a half dollars in um, 24. Um, also, if you've been driving, you notice that, you know, fuel has started to increase and whether that's going to, you know, level off or whether that's going to continue to increase could have a significant impact um, once our, our fleet is, is fully operational again. And then the, the mandates, um, that just actually um, outlines the specific mandates right now that the House is proposing on restricting the use of those ESSER funds. And you all are, are well aware about the pending charter school referendum litigation. We did pre prevail initially on two lower courts. The uh, fourth district court of appeal through that en banc ruling uh, reversed uh, those two lower court opinions. Uh, the office of general counsel, um, even though the board is intending to appeal, uh, the office of general counsel has recommended uh, that the district set aside the funds that would be the district, the potential charter school share in FY22 pending the outcome um, of that appeal. So that it would be approximately $25 million um, that we're going to have to set aside for next year. And the Commissioner of Education sent out communication um, to districts earlier in March um, outlining some guidance on the ESSER funds 
um, the ESSER II funds and how those funds should be utilized. And I wanted to highlight um, the fourth and fifth bullet where he specifically mentioned in there that these funds should be, we, we districts should plan that these funds would be used to cover any additional students that were over and above what was included in the initial budget um, uh, for FVFP. And then also that we should monitor, you know, the legislative session, if we were to have a cut, these funds would be used, expected to be used to make up any of that shortfall. But looking at the initial House and Senate budget proposal, that doesn't seem to be as much of a risk as when we initially received this letter. Because when we initially received this letter, we were very concerned that a big chunk of these dollars would have to be set aside for that purpose until we actually knew what enrollment was going to be. Um, and I mean, we still have that concern, um, but especially now we're hopeful that with the additional revenue, um, with the, the positive revenue outlook, um, that some of that money would be directed to education to help mitigate the potential risk of having to um, take some of our ESSER dollars to utilize for that purpose. All right, I'm going to jump in here. Uh, you know, I was thinking this budget, we're, we're really in an unusual position, all right, because you just heard from Ms. Canoose. On one hand, our general fund operating budget is hurting. You know, we have declining enrollment. We've got probably flat funding, maybe a slight increase in state funding. And we've got some rising costs with fuel and electricity and FRS rates. So the, our general fund operating budget is going to be under great strain. And then we have also this issue with the referendum that we have to reset and maintain the equilibrium and the, the one mil levy and the revenue it generates and how we spend those dollars. So that, that's kind of a tough situation. And then on the other hand, we've got the largest infusion of federal dollars ever in the history of our nation. So I don't know if you guys remember the novel Rich Man, Poor Man, or it was a mini series in the 1970s, uh, but <laughs> it was two brothers, right? And they both started from humble beginnings and the one became a wealthy businessman. The other one scrapped to, to get by by uh, being a boxer. But I feel like we're going to get to play both roles in this type of rich man, poor man scenario because we're, we've got a lot of federal money to work with, and then we're, on, you know, we're going to also spend time just uh, trying to get by and keep our operating budget balanced. The, it's, it's really a tremendous thing here, and the, you know, with all this money also comes great responsibility, and we're going to face a lot of scrutiny on how these dollars are used, and it's an exciting time as the board is work on your strategic plan that you you know you here you've actually got some money to work with right this this could be a very big part of the strategic strategic plan you know how we go about using these federal dollars uh, and so I like this quote uh, by a columnist that was an editorial in the Boston Globe uh, but you know they, the quote was the, this once in a lifetime windfall is a good problem for schools to have but it'll be a tricky one and best solved by focusing on those most in need of rescue and I like the latter part the best. You know, I don't really like windfall because we, we need these dollars and we have a lot of uh, unmet needs and the, you know, the kids need our help. But I think that is just a good focus that as we start planning on how to spend these dollars, that, that's where we turn our attention. Who is most in need of rescue? And we know from the work uh, that Dr. Sheffield and Mr. Oswald have done in starting to do the diagnostics and look at the data, we have a lot of kids in, in, in need of rescue that are significantly behind, uh, both academically and socially emotion social emotionally. Uh, so to quantify this, it's the, you know, just if you focus in on district operate share, if you combine ESSER 1, ESSER 2, and ESSER 3, we'll have over $540 million coming to us for the next three years. Now, ESSER 1, we, we spent. That, that's in the rearview mirror, and we use that money to get through this year and deal with COVID and cost of PPE and everything else. But you've still got $500 million or half a billion dollars over the next three years to use, um, you know, to... To, to meet our needs uh, and primarily address the, the, the unfinished learning. The, we get these funds based on the same formula from the federal government that we get Title I dollars, right? So it's, it's based on that free and reduced lunch information. Uh, the charter schools just, they get their share just based on their enrollment. So there's a little disconnect there. The charters, they're gonna get their money just based on the size of their school. It doesn't matter if their kids are in free or reduced lunch, but that, that's out of our control. And then the private schools got a share of SR1, but they, They've got a separate allocation that the uh, Congress approved for them, so they're, they're not sharing in these ESSER dollars, but they, they've got their own pot of money. Um, you've got pretty broad discretion on the allowable uses of the ESSER dollars. You know, ESSER 2 uh, can be f used for the same things as ESSER 1. 
Uh, it, it can be used uh, to address learning loss, uh, to save and protect jobs and avoid layoffs and all that good stuff. Um, ESSER 3, ESSER 3 has a few uh, requirements, but uh, you know, I, I think they, f they fit our needs. And you know, the, the big one is that you have to use at least 20% of ESSER 3, which is the American Rescue Plan, to address the loss of learning or what we're calling unfinished learning. And I, I don't see that being a problem. You know, I think ideally we'll spend well beyond 20% because that, that's the most critical aspect of all this. Uh, but there is a pretty long list of things you can use to spend the money on. And we're gonna have to be really thoughtful and deliberate about how we go about this. We've uh, you know, been looking at any guidance we can find out there. Our district has uh, some track record of working with ERS, so I included what they had put together in terms of guiding principles. You know, they said, uh, and you're gonna see some similarity. The, uh, the next group is the Council of Great City Schools that I'm working closely with, but uh, there's some alignment in these recommendations. And the, the first thing from, from both groups is that you gotta, before you do anything, you gotta understand your needs and really quantify, look at the student data, look at how far kids are behind, uh, you know, and using an equity lens to say, you know, where, where do we need to put our money? And then you want to then focus in, you know, this is not a time to experiment and try a lot of, you know, 100 new strategies. They're really recommending that you invest in a few proven strategies, you know, and uh, make sure that you're going to ha have some impact. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and jump to the, the Council of Great City Schools ones because I, like, I really like the way they put this together. And uh, I have, was fortunate enough to be on the group uh, that's, that's working on this, and it's, they're going to be releasing it, information probably on a, almost a weekly basis or periodically. Uh, you know, as, as soon as it's available to, to help districts because this is such a big challenge. Uh, but the over, they laid out some overarching goals. You know, they said first, you know, a lot of districts across the state or across the country haven't even opened yet. So first, you know, make sure you can safely reopen your schools. Uh, we, we've done that. You know, then address the unfinished learning. And then to utilize these monies in a manner that when they're, when they're over and done with in three years that we've built something that's gonna be sustainable and it's gonna have a long lasting impact on teaching and learning and, and, uh, and be equitable. Uh, so I guess I, I don't need to read all these to you, but I'm gonna jump ahead as far as next steps because we need to, again, we need to be very deliberate about how we plan to use these monies. This is not something to like to rush into. Um, we need to take a little time on the front end to build a solid plan and then we have to remain flexible enough over the next three years to, to make course corrections if needed, similar to what I heard Mr. Tierney mention with the strategic plan. Uh, so again, you know, I think we're, it's gonna take a series of workshops <laughs> and we're gonna be fighting to get on your calendar, uh, but we need to build that multi-year spending plan. Uh, you know, this is a big chunk of our budget. This is gonna be about 8% of our traditional operating revenue and just the, the work that goes, you'll be having a workshop on April 21st with Dr. Sheffield and Mr. Oswald on the student academic support plan. You know, that's, that started with phase one with the tutorial work we're doing now in the summer program and then we'll be getting into phase two which will start next school year. Um, this will be the, the funding source behind that and then, and then other items and other board priorities. The guidance from the Council of Great City Schools has been very clear that, you know, we, when we start planning this, we really need to think with the, our goals and the end product in mind, you know, and, and lay out the metrics that we're gonna use to track these investments so that at the end of the day, we can, you know, see what type of return on investment we had. Again, we're gonna have a lot of scrutiny. Um, you know, not everyone was in favor of passing this stimulus bill for schools. Um, and it's just critically important that we're very uh, transparent and deliberate in how we use these dollars and then that we're prepared to monitor and track, account for them, and then demonstrate the impact that they're having for, on our students. The, uh, you know, so communication will be important. And then the big one, uh, number six there for us finance officers is ensure that we plan not just to spend these dollars for the next three years, but ideally create a four or five year spending plan so that we can demonstrate how we're gonna land this thing in three years and have a sustainable finish that doesn't leave us with a huge funding cliff, you know, when. Uh, if you think about $500 million over three years, that's roughly $166 million a year. And we just can't come to a screeching halt and see all these investments stop and you know, have employees that we have to displace. Uh, so there's, it takes a lot of 
uh, planning and how we're going to uh, pace this work, you know, how we phase it over three years, how we, how we build it up, and then how we kind of wind it down, and how we leverage, you know, natural attrition within the district to create potential long-term jobs for people that may step into temporary jobs that are grant funded for two or three years. So it'll be a lot of collaboration with human resources, the academic division, finance, really all aspects of the district, you know, work uh, with the superintendent to come up with a, a really solid recommendation. So that, that's kind of it for today. Oh, there, I got one more slide here. This is kind of the long list of allowable use of ESSER funds. And uh, you'll see, you know, you could buy computers, you could do ventilation projects. Uh, but I think we need to be careful not to use these dollars to try to do a shotgun approach to address a million problems. I think if we really want to have the impact, we need to like focus on a few key initiatives. What's it going to take to really catch the kids back up? You know, if that's more, you know, one-on-one -on -one instruction or small group instruction or more tutors or what have you, uh, what can we do like on the short term or next couple of years to make that big impact and then develop the capacity and maybe, you know, training for the teacher so they can sustain it after that kind of maybe bump in staffing is gone. Um, so I see hands going up. That concludes our, uh, <laughs> we had a timeline. You guys have seen this before. We're working towards budget adoption in September. Tentative budgets in July, which kind of aligns with your strategic plan. To me, all these things are kind of winding together, right? You got strategic plan, the ESSER plan, and your budget, and uh, they should all go together. So it makes sense. Mr. Burke, um, you've been very diplomatic in telling this board to, you know, walk slowly and thoughtfully through this process. As an attorney for 40 years handling estate planning, I've seen people win the lottery, and then within two years, they're broke. And I've seen families inherit lots of money from mom and dad, and within three years, the money's gone. So, uh, you know, I've had this conversation with you already. I trust that you are going to be looking very closely at whatever everybody in this district comes up with on ideas, especially us on this, this side of the dais, to make sure that we do spend the money wisely and prudently, and we don't end up three years from now wondering what we're going to do now because we have no money left to, to fix all these problems that we didn't get done because we didn't do the handle the money prudently so um, thank you for your diplomatic approach to telling us to keep our hands <laughs> out of your pocket um, but uh, Ms. McQuinn I think you were next I raised my hand to thank Mr. Berg along the lines of what you said but for encouraging us to focus on a few well thought out priorities is what you said and priorities and I could not agree more that's awesome thank you for that Mrs. Anders and thank you again Mr. Burke for your work with the council and you said it quite right I'm sitting uh, on a working group also with the council and a couple of things came up that I would like to hear your uh, comments about uh, first of all uh, with this pot of money the ESSER funds and we know that our other budget is the budget that's really shaky. So will we have a break, uh, a separate breakdown as we begin to work through the processes of the things that we want? I know that you're going to be taking care of the real needs of the district as it relates to keeping us making it for the whole year and getting a balanced budget. But this budget is uh, three years in the making. So how will you actually have that separated so that we can kind of know where that money is going? during the um, three-year time frame, which will be fluid because we'll be using it. Yes, so this, you know, these federal dollars will be a big component of our total budget, but they'll be in a special revenue fund, much like Title I dollars are or, or Title II. Uh, the, you know, part of the ESSER dollars are intended to help deal with, you know, it's a direct result of COVID-19. And, and we do have some costs related to COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So there, there will be some opportunity for things that have hit the operating budget that we now have a funding source to, to cover. Uh, so we'll, we'll be having that conversation, saying, okay, we've got 500 million for and these ESSER dollars. You know, some of this is gonna have to go to PPE to start the school year and you know, some of our costs related to COVID. But I think the, the big buckets will be, you know, what do we wanna do about learning loss? And uh, mm -hmm. the you know, ventilation, I'm hearing a lot of school districts talking about using some of this for capital projects and ventilation and all that. Uh, there is work on a, you know, another 
stimulus package at the federal level for two billion, I'm sorry, yeah, two billion basically in infrastructure projects across the nation, which uh, at this point they're talking about 100 billion for schools. So I would, uh, if we were gonna use this money for capital projects, I'd wanna be really clear that it was really directly impacted by COVID and it's a response to COVID and not necessarily try to stretch it too far. But uh, computers is one thing. We're, you're gonna have a policy discussion later on computers, which is we've invested quite a bit into this year and we'll have to sustain that. So there, there are some of those things that maybe are currently in the operating budget or the capital budget that could f fit into these grants for a couple of years. Uh, so it is gonna be kind of intertwined, mm -hmm. but from an accounting standpoint, we must account for this dollar, these dollars separately. Mm -hmm. uh, we will set up separate programs to track them. And like I said, it, we're gonna be on the hook to be able to show how we spend every dollar and, uh, and hopefully then also show how that's moved the needle on student achievement. And th th that'll be uh, very tricky and deliberate to make sure we have all those systems in place. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Let me just follow up Mr. Barbieri with him. Um, uh, so a piece of this is uh, a communication strategy, you know, that uh, the community will have a chance to weigh in and not just at maybe a board workshop or one board meeting. It's got to be tracked somewhat to find out uh, exactly uh, what the community is saying and how we are actually responding back to the community in terms, just like you said, that we may be spending money on computers and other things and unfinished learning and so on. And so that dialogue has to be something, I think, that's gonna be ongoing uh, through some type of uh, communication strategy. So are you working along with uh, Claudia Shea and communications to build a communication strategy for us? Yes, that, that's on the list of things to do for sure. Uh, the, the American Rescue Plan did require that, you know, I think it was geared more toward districts that hadn't reopened yet, but they said they wanted your, your reopening plan had to get had to get public input on that process. We've already done a reopening plan and then a second one for the spring to the FDOE. Uh, but I would never recommend that we shy away from public input, right? So we, I need to, uh, I was hoping, you know, we'll have to figure out what the venue is for that. Uh, and of course we can put, we'll be publishing and we can put things online and yeah, I'll, I'm gonna, I'll work with Michelle and Mr. Tierney to figure out the best approach to that. And I wanna also, it's, it's kind of early in this process. I wanna kind of see what, uh, best practices are, what, how other districts are going about it, and, in, and make sure that we do a good job with that. And thank you, Mr. Burke, because I mean, that work is every week. And so I'm sitting there with uh, my committee, my small group. So this was a great presentation today. So thank you. Thank you. Ms. Whitfield, then Ms. Ayala, and then Ms. Brill. Thank you. I just, um, first of all, thank you so much for bringing this to us. Um, when we did our raise for our employees this past year, I felt like we were pre-spending some of this money in the hopes that we were getting it. Is that um, something that you're taking into account? Um, and is it, what's the impact of that? Well, uh, these funds really are, are, are not gonna be going to employee salary increases. Um, so no, it, it really doesn't factor into that. You know, we're, we're gonna balance the operating budget on its own. Um, that is, a, a, I'm glad you asked the question because it's a great point. So, but when I go to the bargaining table this year, I'll be the poor man, right? It's not gonna be, <laughs> it's not gonna be the rich man showing up with all the federal dollars because I think the only way that these dollars maybe will benefit our current employees is that if, if you know, if we, if we have extra jobs we need them to take on, you know, if, if we do tutorial programs or if we, had any type of extended learning or, you know, we, and, and that's a tricky balance too, because you only got so much capacity, you know, so much work you can expect of people. But no, this, these dollars should really not even be pointed to when it comes to talking about salary increases. Ms. Ayala. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Burke, how much additional projected revenue would um, not rolling back the RLE bring forward? That's gonna, that's gonna put about 212 million, over 200 million into the state coffers. Uh, it's not as much as it normally would be. You know, if in better times when tax values were increasing 5% a year, it, it would have brought in probably triple that amount. Uh, but it, it's nice to see, we've been asking for that for years. <laughs> and now I think the state did it kind of out of desperation because they're, you know, they need every dollar they can get. Uh, and so it's not having the impact like it may have had if they had been doing this for three or four years and building up reserves or something, but uh, at least it's positive and that it's a fairly painless way to, 
to put more money into education. Yeah, I, I have a follow up, Mr. Chairman. I asked because the market's doing so well, which then led me to ask a question Ms. Whitfield already sort of asked, but where employee raises fall with the budget outlook, given what we did this year for next year? Is your answer still the same if we're looking at general funds and not these specific funds? Yeah, you know, when we started last school year, I was not optimistic there'd be any employee salary increases. And then the, the governor funded the lion's share of our salary increases with his $500 million to raise the starting teacher salary. So then we, you know, the board uh, was, I thought, generous and very equitable in that they said, you know what, all employees need some level of salary increase. So we kind of stretched things there. And we, we benefited from the state holding us harmless on our enrollment and keeping our funding in place. Uh, when we started last school year, none of those things were for sure. In fact, I expected full well that we would get adjusted for the second semester and we'd start losing revenue. Uh, so I, I was really ple pleasantly surprised by those executive orders that really truly held us harmless. But, you know, that, that's kind of gone in behind us and I'm hoping that the employees will appreciate that 3.5% raise and realize that it was kind of an unexpected nice thing to happen and it, it may have to last them a while because you know, as long as our enrollment's down 6,000 kids and the state thinks we're flush with federal dollars and they're not really interested in increasing the base student allocation, it's gonna be lean. And uh, there is gonna be kind of these two different worlds where we're gonna have federal dollars to do some really important work, uh, but we're, it's, it's limited and it, it can't be used to, to just uh, increase salaries of, of people in our operating budget. Thank you so much. And I would just follow up, you know, as, as, as Heather and Mike and Leanne have taught me about the budget over the years, so with the ESSER dollars, they have an end date. Our general operating rating fund rolls over every year. So since that number will be small, we can't do salary increases with ESSER money because it is never, it's not going to continue in perpetuity. So when we get these, so that's, I mean, that, the example with the rich man, poor man is actually pretty good because we, put, we fund our salaries through the reoccurring costs. Not money that has a, 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 a cliff. That's the, and I think in the superintendent's conferences with the council and just around, this has people getting a lot of anxiety because you hear the big numbers, but it really can't. I mean, we, and I think, and I'll just say this out loud for the principals, you know, we have to be, you want to talk about getting audited over the next three years. It is going to be intense. Everything we do, and so I think we all have to get prepared for a lot of systems of checks and balances over the next three years in a way I don't think we've experienced before. Vice Chair Winbro. Thank you. So I have a question, but you don't have to pull up the slide. It refers to, to slide 13, and I may have follow-up after it. So that slide shows the breakdown between the district-operated schools, the charter schools, and the private schools. Are we the pass-through for the funds for the charter schools, or does it go directly? We, we are the pass-through, yes. So then if I may follow up, I have two questions. One is, do they need to follow the spending the way we determine? Okay, so they uh, can no, do they their do own not. thing. No, they do not. They'll be able to. Okay, and are we um, responsible for monitoring, because I know the scrutiny is going to be there on us. Are we responsible to monitor how the charter schools spend those dollars and the private school, the private schools only get it, you know, for 2022. So, uh, yes, I think you've kind of answered your own questions there. We, we are the pass through. We, we do have responsibility for oversight. Uh, the charter schools, they'll be able to look at that federal guidance okay. potentially and use the money for any of those things that are allowable under federal guidance. They're, you know, Ms. Canoose is the expert on this because you really monitor charter schools. Would you like to add anything about how that process yeah, works? So we require the charter schools to submit to us the same information we're required to submit to the DOE. Um, so they will have an, uh, an approved budget that they submit. Um, DOE, it depends on whether they require us to submit the plans to them for approval, but regardless of whether we submit them to them, we have them. Um, and then in terms of uh, for the, the private schools, we can't pass the money through to the private schools for that one share, for that, that's only an ESSER one. We have to buy those items on their behalf. And so those, in, you know, so they're following all of our regular rules and procedures. Any assets that are purchased are actually ours, district assets. So, yeah, we heavily monitor those funds and, and we're required to um, it, it, through the federal regulations. Thank you. So the private schools will buy stuff, but we have to buy it for them and then deliver the merchandise that they want? Correct. 
Yes, and it, it, they have to remain um, school district um, assets. They're, we're not allowed to pass the money through to them. Or if, if, if they want tutorial services, we, we contract with the tutorial firms uh, and provide that service. Are we getting any extra dollars for taking care of the private, the private schools to handle all the stuff that they want us to do? Well, I'm just, I'm, I'm just, we're fortunate it's only an ESSER one that we had to deal with it okay. and not the other two. And there were some exceptions because the, the funds were retroactive to March where we were allowed to do some reimbursements, but we required them to provide um, supporting documentation so we have that uh, available for, for our district audits. Okay. And Mr. Superintendent, you know, I'm sure that you've already factored this in, but certainly while we're deciding, while the district decides and the board decides how we're going to spend this money, we need to make sure the teachers are involved, not just the CTA president, which I had give him a lot of credit because he's a very smart young man, but I mean, the teachers that are in the classroom every day that know what their kids need based on what they've been through for the last year and a half. So hopefully we're going to get a lot of input. I, as one board member wanted the public input, certainly there's no more important person to give us input than the teachers that have to teach these kids and help them catch up. So hopefully we're going to get a lot of input from them. Yes? Yes. I mean, that guidance that says, you know, start with the end user in mind, that, that's what they're trying to say is like, think about how this is going to impact your teachers. You know, if, if you're going to do this program, what does that mean in their daily life? You know, can they, do you have to take something off their plate to make this work possible? And then also extend it to the students. What does this mean to this student day? You know, how, how much time are they going to be spending, you know, doing whatever? So, yeah, that needs to be the mindset and we'll, we'll have to get the input. Okay, great. Any other questions? Dr. Robinson? So thank you for the presentation and thank you for saying repeatedly that we need to address learning loss because we do. Um, and I think part of that addressing learning loss, whether we're talking about the COVID slide or the pre-existing differential, um, somewhere we need to acknowledge that <laughs> maybe it's taking something off their plate, but the, we need to we need to acknowledge that we have to figure out how to support our teachers in doing a better job because either either there's room for improvement which i think exists in every human or we're just saying the children are defective right i don't know that we're saying that i think that we're saying the adults we actually heard this in our in our last workshop that, the, that we as a system need to acknowledge that we need to do a better job of supporting the adults um and our primary purpose in being here is to educate children so um, somewhere in there, and I don't see those words in here, but in my mind, um, and I don't want to say professional development, it's, it's more than that, but just supporting the teachers and supporting the children. How about that? And then we also need to look, um, listen to our other um, employees. And, and I'm just going to say, I said it before, but I had the opportunity to say it here, that I think that some of these one-time funds need to be used for making sure that we have appropriate HVAC, HVAC systems to um, so we can be ready for, and I, I'm going to hate to say it, but I need y'all to understand, the next pandemic. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I was just add, Dr. Robinson, I think the language they use in the document about teachers is um, intentionally increasing their capacity. And the reason why that's so important is because when the cliff happens, so your investments have to be so that it can continue beyond the money. And so a lot of it is, uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it, we're all gonna have to have our, I mean, and this ain't just the teachers, this is all of us, principals, the board, like the level of intentionality. But I wanna just keep something one of y'all said, like we have to think, like if I had a perfect world, to be honest with y'all, we would look at K-12 and sit down every class we teach and then say, what do we stop teaching? Like literally, like uh, we have to really start thinking about an, an amount of hours that we have in a day because, you know, I think this board has said on different occasions, you know, at a certain point, we just got to think about the basics. You know, like, 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 tr like literally looking at the basics. And you, Mr. Barbieri and I and others have had conversations around the new world that is happening. You know, we've been so immersed in the trauma of trying to deal with COVID as a school system, but, but the children and young people in this whole uh, social media world have created a whole new ecosystem of information going back and forth and you know so you know i will say today one of the things that i have been working on you know privately is getting you know community support around financial literacy 
because of what's actually happening. And each, I've talked to almost every board member. There's a young person in your life who has now figured out how to monetize selling shoes and video games. And, and, it's, and when you start to really investigate it, the numbers that some of these kids are generating are huge. And so I think, it's, I think that's gonna be part of our, like this new capacity. Where do we wanna go in the future? And how do we make sure that we're setting our kids? I mean, think about you know, the distance learning. As painful as that was, the majority of our teachers have a new skill set. As painful as that was, but every week we saw them getting better and better and better. I'm now hearing about you know, some of your children and grandchildren who are in college, but I'm gonna move to New York, but I'm gonna take my classes at FAU. They haven't even been on a campus of University of Florida. And a lot of them don't even desire it at this point. So, it, you know, we think about, um, we talk about this amongst ourselves, about the high school kids. How many of them have picked up jobs out of necessity? Or just because they didn't have anything else to do, they picked up jobs. And so when we ask them to come back to brick and mortar, some of them are going to have to give up their livelihood to come back to school. And so we just have to think about this, the, the forced innovation of COVID and then the reality that many of us have been doing something for a year, and it is now part of our DNA. So the example that I use that people laugh about is I don't think I'll ever go inside of another grocery store in my life. I like it when the bags show up at the door. It's just, it's just, and then, and then if you use the app appropriately, it'll tell you, you have saved 73 hours in shopping. Ooh, that is, I got my life back. So I just, I just want us to think about, um, and then th this team, Palm Beach County, this team has led, uh, in a lot of instances, the country on innovating and, and really doing things differently. And we did it out of necessity because we were just buried in the, in the work. But now that you have schools that don't even start back until t like Monday of this week, and we've been doing it since September, we've got to, one, acknowledge that and, and praise ourselves for that. But then let's go back and reflect on what we actually built and see how we intertwine that in the future as we increase our capacity. I just wanted to say that because it is, I, every day I'm increasingly realizing there's a new day out there. There's a new revolution that has happened with our children and young people that we have to, we have to embrace. Uh, we really, because, you know, we talk about the music thing and, you know, another challenge that we're going to have is, a, even if you, you said you wanted to increase every music program in, in our district, teachers is going to be a problem. Like literally getting that many high quality teachers. So what do we do differently? And I think the example I use, my son has been taking, he was a, a beginning music teacher at Wellington Landings, music student, but the entire COVID experience, he had a private lesson teacher in New Orleans. So every, every Sunday, he's sitting in front of a computer with a headset on practicing with a, with a person hundreds, if not you know, hundreds of miles away. So how do we look at some of these technologies to make sure that our children get to get experiences from high quality folks um, that look like them, that, that are, you know, some, in some cases, I'm, I'm noticing a lot of kids doing a lot of traffic on social media, learning math and other skills from kids their age. It is a very fascinating thing what is happening out there. And uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Ms. Ayala and I have been talking about this. It is, I, I encourage all of us to really start talking to our young people about how life has really changed for them um, as we think about how we design our future work. Because I think it's exciting. I mean, it's going to be hard. Lord knows it's going to be hard. But I think it's going to be very exciting to really be, because we've been open so long, being a leader in whatever innovations we create um, to meet the needs of all of our kids. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Ayala, then Mrs. Andrews. On a lighter note, Dr. Pinoy, you said you were the only musician up here. I'm proudly trained at Palm Springs Middle and John I. Leonard on the I, I apologize. I apologize. I <laughs> we apologize. all love the arts, but I, I just wanted to make it that shout out to my classical training here. Hey, I can play the accordion. Every Italian kid can play the accordion. So you know, let's, let's count that in, too. Uh, Mrs. Andrews. And thank you. And I'm just back on the communications piece. Certainly, I want the teachers and others to have input. But uh, Mr. Burke, this was an excellent presentation and I think it can be uh, uh, detailed and refined because we have many educational advisory uh, groups that we're presenting before each month. Uh, the region superintendents are out there with me as well as principals and so on. And we need to be talking because we're going to be getting input and I know this input's going to be different and it's going to be ongoing, but if we educate parents and begin to educate our community about what's going on as far as the funding is concerned from the standpoint of what's coming from the state as well as what's coming from the ESSER funds and how it's going to work over the next three days. 
the more the more the merrier. You know, you don't want to kind of do a one-time shop. You can start beginning to talk about how much it is we've got, how we're going to actually look for voices, voices from all a uh, angles, and uh, and start educating people. And I think we what we've done today was educate us. And uh, and I know that you've been on those committees, so and I've been on them too. So I think we can do some small uh, vignettes, some mini uh, presentations now as we're moving forward with uh, talking to people, because we're everywhere. And so we need to be letting people know what this is all about, because we don't want it just to hit them at one time, and all of a sudden they're trying to digest it. And so we know a lot of people have a lot of ideas on how we're going to help kids who have unfinished learning, as well as the kinds of things that we experienced before COVID. And parents have a lot of ideas of what needs to happen. And we know we've got some areas of Palm Beach County in our ELL and ESE and, and, and Glades and African American communities and schools where we got so much work to be done. I think parents need to kind of have a picture of what's happened with this money that came from the government and be able to kind of know that they'll have a true voice along with the school board and everybody else. All right, Mr. That's Superintendent, good. if you uh, have anything else for us with this Chairman, workshop. I have no more comments at this time. We need a motion to adjourn the workshop. Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, seconded by Dr. Robinson. Any discussion? All in favor, opposed? The workshop is ended, and uh, the board clerk has asked for a five-minute break. So if we can come back here at 5, 5.35, five minutes from now. Oh, yeah, well, I guess we need to do that first. Dr. Shelford, can you, can you come in uh, and review with the board? Um, so we'll unadjourn the workshop, okay? Everybody agree? We're unadjourned. Okay, thanks. Um, board chair and board members, Dr. Fanoy, thanks for allowing the team the opportunity to just reconvene I'm on the feedback that was provided to us um, on the workshop around policy 5.016. What we've done, we've just captured some of the um, feedback and comments by board members. Um, hopefully, we've captured all of them. Um, but as I go through them, of course, um, the team, we did our very best. And you will definitely let us know if, we have missing, if we've missed one piece. And I'll start with um, Ms. Brill. Um, of course, Ms. Brill, um, what is the purpose of of, of our K-8 schools and a board workshop at a later time on K-8 so that we can redefine our purpose here as a district and review the enrollment of all of our school, all of our K-8 schools as we talk about the intended purpose. And of course, the capacity of our K-5 schools to accommodate our K-8 students and facilities. Um, it came up with Mrs. Burrell, the facilities to accommodate K-8 existing potentials to add more seats via concretables, future K-8s designed on the onset to accommodate K-5 and 6-8. Um, Mrs. Whitfield, um, Plumosa's impact on Carver, concerns around students outside of Plumosa having access in the South County School of the Arts, discussion around boundary changes, Problematic enhancements for um, program, I should say programs enhancements for Carver Middle and the K-8 after school activities, the cost, and the K-8 extracurricular activities and sports, the perception that is out there, making sure that parents understand the implications of the K-8s around those two pieces. And the arts at Carver and more arts in South County area. And the initial intent for Plumosa as a South Area School of the Arts um, was your understanding. Dr. Robinson, um, I'll come back to Dr. Robinson. I'm going to go <laughs> as I come up for air. <laughs> Mrs. Andrews, uh, Mrs. Andrews, um, the dual language continuum for District 6 and the eligibility criteria, really looking at our eligibility criteria for our choice programs. I'm educating our parents around the choice process and making sure that we're working with our parents and they fully understand the process. Equity, equity in our programs as you're having the discussions now with the board in your workshops around the strategic process for the upcoming strategic plan. 
and a diversity in the recruitment strategies, transportation for the Glade students to the coastal schools to be provided those opportunities, and the continuation discussion around West Tech, increased programs, specifically the arts, like Wellington Landing has an art program, but they're in need of a stage. And want to see numbers on choice, on choice programs, demographically broken down, um, investigate how we look in terms of choice, which was somewhat aligned to what Dr. Robinson has asked for around an analysis an audit of our choice programs. Ms. McQuinn, Ms. McQuinn um, comments around H.L. Watkins, the enrollment and the programs, and comments on the project-based learning and the positive effects um, of project-based learnings, um, which is a reflection and a true indicating, uh, indicator of what's happening over there at the conservatory school. And Mrs. Ayala, Mrs. Ayala, um, the request for um, our choice data, um, dual language continuum and filling the gaps um, within, um, within the area, and then comments on the mental health of our students due to COVID and the possible added stress when not assigned to a choice program. And our board chair, Mr. Barberi, um, emphasizing the need for the K-8 workshop um, and the language around the custodial parent, which we indicated that we would work with legal on that because you're concerned around the 50-50 in the custodial parent that both parents could deem themselves as the custodial parent. And we indicated that we would work with the legal. And a special um, policy idea was a discussion, was just a discussion that you were having around the art school. And students at K-8 going to zone schools for activities and sports, which aligns with Mrs. Whitfield's comment around just making sure that our parents and community understand students participating in K-8, what are the ex what's their opportunities for the extracurricular activities, including um, aftercare programming. And Dr. Robinson. <laughs> Dr. Robinson, <laughs> Dr. Robinson, um, policy lines eight and nine, review the non-discrimination statement um, and with the Office of OCR, and that's where we were talking as it pertains to the line around the um, Boy Scouts. And line 16, review the language around the English skills, particularly with the ELL piece we were talking about, and you asked us to look at the wording, the rewording of that when we talked about the limited access and so forth. Lines 120 to one to, through 125 add the right to refusal language into that, um, into that space. One thir line 139, replace limited to one exception. Not to say limited is only one exception, so why not call out one? And what did we agree to in the beginning for k 8 Look at the history. So you've asked us to go back and look at the history to when we started. Um, the initial K-8, what was it that came to the board um, and the understanding of the board of what our K-8 schools would look like. So we would have to do some research there. You didn't? I did. You did. Okay. Transportation mapping across the district, review of where the gaps are, and I think that's the mapping that came back at one of our initial um, choice presentations. And if the question is where is that transportation, transportation mapping, where are we and how can we look at the gaps um, here as a district and review the curriculum and staffing for the choice programs. Um, the adjudicators, criteria outlined as a district and not just um, collecting resumes and leaving it to the individual schools, right? And line 207, add language to read next, cho next choice cycle instead of next school year. Line 292, the addition makes up makeup days, clean up the language, meaning that they should be some makeup days in there and could we clean up that portion? And agreeing with the choice five-year plan that we should have and continue with the choice five-year plan and similar language for the arts as a continuum like we have for IB um, and FAU, but I think there was a piece of biomedical, biomedical. or something, biomedical with that FAU. And line 571, 
grade six, um, the common language revision. And then the analysis of the choice program, which is the audit, I think I had already mentioned that. Um, and then the definition of success and choice program. What is our definition of success? What are we looking for and how would we describe that for our choice programs for the school district of Palm Beach County? And again, board members, um, we captured, this is what we've captured. If we've left out anything or need to add, by all means, please let us know. Ms. Brew. Thank you, and, and this isn't you leaving this out, but I'd be remiss if I don't bring it up. I know that when you mentioned Mrs. Andrews' item, uh, I believe it was about the dual language feeder pattern. Um, I would be remiss if I don't, didn't say you need to look at the whole district, because I have that issue with Hagen Road, where Okahili Middle is the feeder pattern for the dual language. So I do think we need to look at the whole district and not be district centric on any of the stuff that we mentioned. If one of us mentioned something in our district, let's look at the whole, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sheffield. Yeah, thank right, you. We'll go ahead, we'll go ahead and, and break now until 545.